Welcome back, everyone. A formal announcement expected by the Trump administration tomorrow that it intends to move its Israeli embassy, Jerusalem, and recognize it as the capital. The move is not only angering Palestinians and key Arab allies of the United States, it's also drawing a difference of opinion from within the Jewish community itself. Supporters claim it merely underlines an historical fact, while critics say it wrongly breaks from seven decades of U.S. bipartisan policy. On Jerusalem. Steve McDonald joins us in Toronto. Steve is with the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs and supports the relocation of the U.S. Embassy and from Washington on why this embassy relocation is a bad idea. Josh Rubner, author of Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israeli-Palestinian Peace. Steve, let me start with you. Why do you believe this is a long overdue decision? What's your reaction? Well, I think it is a long time coming. Uh, even an atheist who's an archaeologist will tell you that there are uh, mountains of evidence attesting to the 3,000-year the history of the Jewish people in Israel as the indigenous land of the Jewish people. And for thousands of years, Jews saw Jerusalem as their national capital, which is why shortly after the State of Israel was established, uh, Israelis declared Jerusalem their capital. They built their, uh, their Knesset there, their parliament, as well as uh, various government offices. And ultimately, whatever the United States does, uh, in the end, whether they recognize it or not, uh, it's not going to, to affect the reality on the ground, which is that Jerusalem already is Israel's capital. Okay. To the, uh, to, Josh? Sorry. Josh? Well, nope. Yes, nobody is denying the fact that there is a deep historical and religious connection between the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem, but the deep historical and religious connections exist for Palestinian Christians and Muslims as well. And what Trump is doing tomorrow by potentially declaring Jerusalem to be Israel's capital is recognizing a situation in which Israel would have an exclusive claim to sovereignty over the totality of the city. And what this does would undercut Palestinian national claims to their city and their holy sites there as well. And what it does is it entrenches an emerging one-state apartheid reality where Israel maintains complete control over all of historic Palestine and Palestinians are relegated to a permanent, separate and unequal status, not only in Jerusalem, but under Israeli military occupation in perpetuity in the West Bank and Gaza as well. Steve, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think Canadians, frankly, are tired of the blame game. I think they're tired of these sorts of loaded terms and accusations being thrown back and forth. And what they really want to hear is what the two sides are doing to advance peace, to, to put forward compromises, and to build a better future for their children. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, Israel has, since 2000, offered three significant uh, peace proposals which would have built a Palestinian state, which included a Palestinian capital in the eastern part of Jerusalem. So the idea that uh, you can't have uh, a two-state solution simply because Israel's capital in, is in Jerusalem is something of a red herring. And I think that, to the contrary, those Palestinian leaders who today are calling for acts of violence in response to this are deeply irresponsible and doing a mass disservice to the Palestinian cause itself. Let me just, on that point, according to Mustafa Barghouti of the Palestinian Legislative Council, he says if President Trump moves the embassy, he will be killing completely any future American role in the future peace process. And we heard from President Abbas spokesman today who agreed with that. Take a listen. This is against the international law, and this, is, this will be unacceptable from our side. Uh, if this happens, uh, it would complicate things. It would put an obstacle to the peace process. Maybe it will be the end of the peace process. Josh, what do you think? Do you think this will put an end to the peace process? Well, I think the peace process has been dead for a long time. There was a last-ditch effort by President Obama and his Secretary of State, John Kerry, to try to clinch a two-state resolution to this issue at the end of the Obama administration. But the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has made it explicitly clear that there will never be a Palestinian state under his leadership, and he is at the left wing of his governing coalition. Uh, there is almost unanimity within Israeli governing circles today that Palestinians should have no sovereignty over any portion of historic Palestine whatsoever. So who killed the peace process is Israel. 
and Israel's refusal to allow the Palestinians to have a genuine state with sovereignty in Jerusalem, all previous proposals that were on the table would not have allowed for Palestinian sovereignty within Jerusalem. Instead, it would be located outside of the boundary of the wall that Israel has built illegally that cuts Palestinian neighborhoods in Jerusalem in two, and it would render Palestinian sovereignty within what we understand as traditionally being Jerusalem an impossibility because of this wall. So what Steve said is not at all accurate that Israel has uh, offered Palestinians a shared capital in Jerusalem. It wants it all for itself, and this is exactly what Trump's announcement is designed to do tomorrow, cede complete Israeli uh, sovereignty over the totality of the city. Uh, Steve, I have to give you a chance to respond to that. Respond to that before I ask my next question. Sure. Well, to the contrary, those three peace proposals, two in 2000, 2000 and 2001 and one in 2008, did include a Palestinian capital in the eastern neighborhoods of Jerusalem. Sadly, the reason there are some uh, security barriers in the city is because of Palestinian terrorism. But all of that's a, a moot I, point well, ultimately because... Let me, let, me, let me just ask you this, because we're on the topic of Jerusalem tonight, given the yeah. fact of what Donald Trump will be doing tomorrow, which is upending decades of American foreign policy. Canada, other allies, uh, and previous American policy would be Canada considers the status of Jerusalem can be resolved only as part of a general settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli dispute. Canada does not recognize Israel's unilateral annexation of East Jerusalem, for example. What position does this, what does it mean Will, will Donald Trump, with one move tomorrow, take this out of the negotiations going forward? Steve. Well, a wise historian once said that the only pressure Israelis can't resist is an embrace. And if you look back at previous administrations, whether Republican or Democrat, the biggest breakthroughs in the peace process have taken place when there was a president that Israelis felt really understood their security needs and supported them on key issues like Jerusalem. And so there could be a bigger play uh, behind the scenes here. It could be that this is the first initiative to demonstrate a symbolic gesture to Israelis and therefore pave the way for other concessions and compromises from leaders on both sides, but I will add this. Israelis feel very vulnerable in the Middle East. This is a tiny country surrounded by a region that largely rejects its very right to exist, and therefore they look to the Americans for backing on some of these core issues, and when they have had that kind of backing, they've been able to make significant compromises for peace. Okay, well, Josh, let me ask you, what do you think the impact will be? Can, can the Americans, um, if the Israelis trust the Americans so much and they make this move and it reinforces that relationship, as Steve has said, then given what's happened, do you think the Palestinians will have an issue with the Americans being part of the peace process going forward? Well, I think the Palestinian team has made it quite clear that if President Trump goes through with this, there will be no more contact between the Palestinians and the U.S. administration and certainly no negotiations because what Trump is doing by this move is emboldening the most right-wing and annexationist tendencies within the Israeli government and Israeli society. And if we talk about potential violent repercussions, what this does is embolden extremist Israeli Jews who are agitating with the cooperation of the Israeli government to replace Islamic holy sites in Jerusalem with a rebuilt temple. They will see this as carte blanche, this U.S. recognition of Israel's claims to Jerusalem to proceed with those very violent plans, which could really touch off a, a religious war. Steve? Very dangerous things happening. Do you think this could touch off a religious war? I, I think my colleague is speculating, unless he has some inside White House knowledge that we don't have, uh, to a, a pretty fantastical extent. The fact is, for decades, polling shows that a consistent majority of Israelis favor peace and are willing to make significant compromises, including a two-state solution to achieve peace. But they, what they haven't seen is a Palestinian leader who has stepped forward, like Anwar Sadat of Egypt did, to declare that he truly is ready to end the conflict and make those compromises. And when they have met that partner, uh, whether it was in the form of Jordan or Egypt, you have seen big shifts in, in Israeli decision-making and significant territorial concessions for peace. Um, sadly, we see the opposite from Palestinian leaders this week. We see Hamas inciting violence in response to this decision, a symbolic gesture that frankly doesn't make Jerusalem Israel's capital. Jerusalem has long been Israel's capital. And it's really shameful, I think, ultimately for Palestinians themselves that their leaders are embarking on this dangerous path. Josh? 
Well, I think that's a very paternalistic interpretation. I think that Palestinians have given enormous compromises yeah. by recognizing Israel on 78 percent of their homeland before even beginning negotiations with Israel. And since that time, Israel has whittled down and whittled down and whittled down what it's been willing to offer Palestinians in terms of statehood. Palestinians have never, ever been offered a truly sovereign and independent, self-determining state in negotiations with Israel. Israel's plans, whether it's been left-wing governments or right-wing governments, have always been to confine Palestinians in disconnected little enclaves that don't have real sovereignty and being cut off from any sovereignty in their historic capital of Jerusalem as well. And the notion that the United States has somehow been a benevolent actor in this process is fundamentally wrong because what the United States has done in negotiations stretching back actually to the Ford administration in the 1970s is to act in concert with Israel to predetermine their positions in these negotiations and then try to force these unfair agreements on the Palestinian people. And I think what Trump will do tomorrow will put the final nail in the coffin of this facade uh, of, of uh, this pretense of the United States somehow acting as an honest broker in these negotiations. When, as Aaron David Miller, a former peace process negotiator, said, what the United States does is act as Israel's lawyers in these negotiations. Steve. Well, I, I think President Clinton, who uh, has uh, particular criticisms of Israel, and I don't think anyone can consider President Clinton an extremist, uh, has a very different take on exactly what happened in the early 2000s. Uh, this is the president who told Yasser Arafat, you made me a failure because you walked away from the peace t table without counteroffer. Mm -hmm. And I think what Israelis are most worried about is that in any future peace agreement, there will uh, necessarily be significant risks that Israelis are going to have to take. Uh, what we're talking about on one side is symbolic recognition from the Palestinians of Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. And on the other side, Israelis taking significant steps to withdraw uh, Israel's presence from the West Bank uh, in the hopes that it won't lead to a Gaza 2.0. And frankly, most, can, most Israelis look back at the Gaza experience when Israel left territory without a peace agreement in an effort to achieve peace unilaterally. And they conclude that if they were to do the same in the West Bank without a, a really concrete peace agreement, you would see Gaza 2.0 and frankly, all of Israel would be under intense rocket fire from the West Bank. That's neither in the interests of Palestinians nor Israelis. Ultimately, what's in the interests of both peoples is for both sides to come to the table, I hope in the coming weeks, as part of a, a broader international effort, perhaps, uh, to negotiate uh, serious compromises without precondition and ultimately to do so with the goal of ending the conflict and achieving full mutual recognition. Let me ask you about something that came up in my previous interview uh, with Nora Sarakat, 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 and she was essentially saying, Erekat, sorry, Sayeb Erekat, I was getting confused, she's his niece. Uh, but what she was saying and what others have been saying with reading is that the younger generation of Palestinians, there is a tendency there among some of the younger Palestinians to give up on the two-state solution and go for a single state and fight for their rights within that single state. Steve, what's, the, what's your reaction to that? I, I don't think any reasonable objective uh, party and the international community as a whole has, has adopted the, the two-state consensus. I don't think any reasonable actor looks at a one-state solution as anything but a recipe for anarchy and civil war. Ultimately, the Jewish community overwhelmingly supports the idea of two states for two peoples. This was the, the vision of the United Nations in 1947 when it voted for the partition of the territory, the idea being uh, to secure self-determination for both Jews and Palestinians living within secure and recognized borders. This has been the bedrock of the international consensus for generations, and the reason is very simple. Uh, a previous uh, incarnation of the one-state solution existed under the British mandate, and you had intense violence and intense disagreements. We've been down this road before, and some people have a short view of history, but I would argue to, to my friend who's Palestinian from a, a previous interview that her position actually harms Palestinian aspirations in the end. Josh? Well, again, I would disagree with the very paternalistic attitude of telling Palestinians what's best for them. I think Palestinians are fully capable of determining what is the best future for them. And Israel, under the 
Prime uh, Minister is, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has made it quite clear that there never will be a Palestinian state under his watch. So if there's not going to be a two-state resolution, which Israel has already declared, then Palestinians absolutely have every right to argue for equal rights within the context of a binational or a single state framework. Because how much longer can Palestinians' human rights and national rights be denied under Israel's separate and unequal apartheid regime that it has imposed on the Palestinians. This is the 21st century version of what South Africa did to black South Africans in the 20th century. And just as the international community, regrettably late, found that apartheid in South Africa was unacceptable, so too is the international community now coming around to an emerging consensus that Israel's separate and unequal policies toward the Palestinians also comprise apartheid and need to be dismantled. So if we're not going to have a sovereign Palestinian state, there has to be equality for Palestinians within a democratic framework. Steve, there's that's no other alternative. Steve, there's, that's twice tonight we've heard accusation of apartheid state within Israel. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, first off, I think it does a terrible disservice to people who actually suffered under apartheid. And uh, frankly, I think it's a, a, sh a shameful distortion of, of both uh, uh, the current situation and distortion of, of history. Um, Israel is a liberal democracy. It is the only liberal democracy in the Middle East. It is the only place where you see equality and freedoms for minorities, for women, for the LGBT community, where you see Arabs voting freely, expressing themselves freely in the media, serving on the Supreme Court, serving in the government. Uh, the situation in the West Bank is a, uh, under international law, a legal occupation. It's legal pending the surrounding Arab leadership in the states bordering Israel and surrounding the, and, uh, the Palestinian leadership declaring that they fully recognize Israel's right to exist in peace and security. This has been the bedrock since 1967 when the UN Security Council passed Resolution 242. To ignore that and to claim, oh, this is ultimately about human rights violations and this is ultimately about uh, uh, apartheid is to demonize Israel in a way that's grossly unfair, that doesn't match the reality of the facts. And the goal of doing so, I would argue, is to remove any sense of agency from Palestinians themselves. And that's tragic because Palestinians have a role to play in resolving this conflict. This is such a volatile, uh, volatile topic. It'll be interesting to see what Donald Trump does with this tomorrow, what he actually does announce. I'm sure we'll be talking about it again tomorrow night. Steve McDonald in Toronto, Josh Rubner in Washington. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.